If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and hit the subscribe button as well as the bell to be notified of future videos. Thank you. Hello Internet, welcome back here at Legacy. We have Andre uh, Boyster here. You know, he explained to me how we say his name. For us Burkis, we will say uh, something like Biester, but that's not right, it's Boyster. Uh, that's the German way, Scandinavian way, something like that. And he's got a very interesting uh, history and especially an interesting job as well. But he was part of 3-1 Battalion, that's why he's here. But while we were speaking beforehand, he told me that he's actually in the business of transporting art. You know, as you can imagine, that is, that's not the, your average job, you know, that's not like your normal lawyer or accountant boring people, all of them, I'm sure, being one myself. Laws for insane people. You can just say that to you. Stay away, it's rubbish. There's no money in it either. Anyway, so let's start by that. I mean, you said to me, Andre, and very welcome here, by the way. You said to me you're transporting art, and one of the things you've done was uh, Sarki uh, Bartman. Uh, what if you can just quickly tell us about that? Oh, thanks, Chris. It was a particularly um, interesting project. Uh, Sarki was exhibited in in um, after her death um, in museums and um, she was preserved as a as a skeleton and things and when when it became embarrassing for the for the museums to exhibit a, a person like that um, she was taken downstairs into the into the basements for storage and uh, I think it was uh, Minister Bridget Mambandla at that stage in um, in uh, post ninety four, which started the extradition process of of um, the remains of Saki Bartman to come back to South Africa. Obviously, there was um, a lot of um, political bickering uh, and and ownership um, in, and and things like that around. Um, around uh, where Sarki must be laid to rest, finally. I remember that was a, a few months of discussions. And eventually, um, Hanky in the Eastern Cape was chosen. So, um, Sarki was inherently an, an artifact from a museum, which we had to bring into South Africa. And then, when she was here, it turned into a, a traditional burial with all the respect and um, and the, the the political correctness that that had to go around it. So um, she was um, escorted to to the Eastern Cape, and uh, then with all the traditional um, manifestations, was was laid to rest. Um, was a broadcast on national TV. All the uh, at that stage it was uh, President Thabo Mbeki that was there. And um, yeah, so that was a particularly interesting uh, project. It's not every day that you receive a, a, a art crate and then it turns into a, a, a burial. So that was a unique thing. But other than that, we've done most of um, the important and the well-known um, South African artist. And it's a, it's a very interesting um, industry to be in. Um, and art moves around the globe and it's exhibited all over. So it's you just got to be very careful in our work, obviously, and and entrust the shipping lines and the airlines and so on that takes your crates further. That's that's where you don't have hands on anymore, and that's a and you've got to uh, do your best in, in, in the in the industry. You know, this reminds me of something, and I'm speaking on a correction. I might be wrong. But there used to be these books in South Africa called Lieber Ma or something like that. And it was this guy who writes from the border back to his mom. I don't know if you recall them. But I do recall in one of them, the guy said something like, he can't understand why the Americans are paying so much money for someone to fetch rocks on the moon. Because, you know, he's got an uncle somewhere with a truck who can just go and do it for him a lot cheaper. Of course, it's tongue in the cheek. It was a joke, right? Yes. But of course, when you transport art, it's not that simple, is it? It's not just the guy arriving there with his bucky and just grabbing it. Uh, there must be some protocols involved. 
No, for sure. With with uh, irreplaceable art, um, you know, if you if you transport a normal commodity, you can either repair, replace, or reimburse. But when you have um, the oldest known artwork um, that's uh, was exhumed close to um, Stolbay, um, it, it's the oldest known artwork that we sent to the Smithsonian in Washington, and uh, they made a, a copy and it came back. It was a, a Khoisan person that was engraving on a on a on a shell with a, a sharpened uh, bone, and um, those two pieces from the from the caves in in Stolbay was um, was the oldest known and recorded um, artwork. If you lose or damage something like that. Yeah, you, know, you you cannot replace it, unfortunately. Well, before we go to your army career, there's just one other thing. I recall that Mata Hari was this famous spy who was executed, I believe, by the French in 1917. And she might have been, I think she was a Dutch citizen. Her real name was uh, Margareta Gertrida McLeod, but that she got divorced from. Uh, born Zeller. So I understand after her execution, they, they somehow kept her head. They cut it off and it is still somewhere in some French museum. Uh, it was never buried. It's the same like Einstein's brain. It's still in a jar somewhere. Have you ever had such strange requests? You know, where you have to fetch a body part or something which is a bit gruesome? Yeah, luckily not often. But but yeah, you must remember in in the old days there wasn't um, preservatives. The the preservative of of choice was um, brandy because of the alcohol content. So Napoleon brandy or, or whichever brand you prefer was used to in in a flask to preserve organs and and bits and pieces. And then with the invention of formalin, um, this. Alcohol had to be decanted. Now, there goes the brandy, and uh, in came the, the formula or the, uh, the the new chemical, and um, that obviously prolongs the shelf life of of these macabre um, museum artifacts, which still there's a lot of that around. Yes. Yeah, I believe that Lord Nelson, when he got killed at Trafalgar, was also brought back in a in a big what. Vase, vase, what do you call it in English? Yes, uh, a, a, a vase of, but it would be a big, it would be a big jug, yes. Yeah, no, it would be good. Man, I love history, I must tell all of you, I really love history. That's why I couldn't help asking you a few questions. But he's not here to answer us about this uh, transport business, but if you guys want to you move out somewhere, the man's quite famous in that world, so go and contact him. But tell me, how did you get into the army, Andre. How was it like for normal guys? Did your parents serve perhaps and you felt you wanted a career or were you just called up? Uh, my my dad was a pilot in the South African Air Force uh, in the 50s. I think it was 52 or something like that. I've still got his picture up here in my office. Of his, um was in Donator uh, at the flying school at that stage before it moved to Langebaan and they were flying Harvards. And um, as a young man, Growing up uh, in the in the Cape, Youngsfield was also an aerodrome, and we used to see parachutists and um, and I know they were flying out of Youngsfield at that stage. Uh, Wingfield was operational, but then the flying school and and everything moved to Langebaanweg, um, and uh, Donatar became a different military institution. Um, but yeah, he had a a, a belly landing when the. Um, the wheels didn't want to um, unfold during an approach to, um, to I think it was Youngsfield at that stage. Then the fire brigade would foam the, the, the runway and you would put your aircraft down. Um, but he was unfortunately killed in 76 in, a, in an aircraft accident. But yeah, that didn't lead me up to the, to the military. Um, he wasn't in the Air Force for long, just like a year or two, and then he started uh, flying privately. Um, and one of our um, senior members of our unit, uh, quite frankly, when he heard my surname, he said, uh, do you remember Bertie Boystein? I said, yeah, it was my dad. And he actually taught um, uh, Sven 
Muller to to fly. So it, it, it was a good good circle to to do. But yeah, as a young boy, um, in in the we grew up very close to Weinberg military base. Um, so cadets was big in our school. So we were all like prepped for national service, and our school did particularly well for Trekker High School with um, cadets. And um, yeah, so off I went to Aitsai, then up in uh, then um, in um, for infantry school, and as I said, I, I would have probably stayed there in, in 80, 85. But as destiny would have it, um, Franz Boetus decided my fate that I would go up north and um, and spend some time in the Caprivi and uh, and in the bush. So, did you have any clue when they recruited you to free one battalion from the School of Infantry? Uh, what it's about? Got no idea. I think a, a national serviceman, the, 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 the knee-jerk reaction is that you're trying to survive, trying to sleep and, and trying to feed yourself. So, um, you know, you, you get influenced by maybe some of your, some of your mates. But as I said, the, the big thing to me was um, we had lots of family up. Uh, my mom was born in Kalkama. Or I was actually christened in Kalkama, of all places. So um, there, there was family there. But uh, but Aitsai was, um, as I said, when the recruiters for infantry school came around and I heard Oatswaring and was closer to home, um, that was my that was my volunteer uh message that I got, okay, I can do this at infantry school um, and it's closer to home. And then I said, at the end of, of the phase at infantry school, if somebody selects you to to do something and go somewhere interesting, then by all means. That, and I'm not for one day uh, disappointed about decisions that I made, because no regrets whatsoever. So the process is at the School of Infantry, infantry school, you some officer would come along, he would be dressed in the Bushman, uh, that strange hat of yours. What do you call it anyway? I know it's not a beret. What, uh, the headdress at 3-1 Battalion? It's, uh, it's a bonnie. And initially the unit had berets, and uh, then it was changed to, to bonnies for, uh, based on the, on the Portuguese um, army bush dress, I suppose. Okay, so this bonnie has nothing to do with the Scottish or the... Version no, it's it. not. It's it's not uh, um, related to to the Scottish headdress whatsoever. The Glengarry or something like that, I think it's called. Okay, so they arrive and you volunteer with a few mates, and uh, they take you up. You you fly up with a, with a, with a flossy. Yes. Yeah, so um, that was in December '84. Uh, I, I, as the other guy said, I think the routing was. Um, uh, Infantry uh, at, at the south base was the airport. Um, and then um, either on Dangwa, on Dangwa Rundu, and then on at Rundu, we were we thought we were going to get a bus or something at least. Well, you can't load officers and, and fresh NCOs on the back of a sawmill, for goodness sake. And uh, we said to the driver, this must be some kind of a mistake. Lo and behold, we didn't know what was what was waiting for us. The driver was quite arrogant. He said, the rest guys can get off at the base, but you guys, there's another surprise waiting for you. He obviously knew what was coming. When they say such things, what go through your, through your mind? I mean, you're 18 years old, you're here in the operational area. Some of the three, two guys said to me, they were very concerned because we didn't have rifles on, on that drive to, to wherever they were going. They thought they can, can be killed here. They, they can't defend themselves. Oh, no, of course we were armed with a balsack and um, and and your your brand new uniform and stripes and so on and and we were indignant that uh, we weren't being checked into the NCOs and the officers mess at least with uh, white sheets and and um, iron iron sheets and uh, yeah we had no we were above the red line so to speak so yeah if we're gonna get dropped off in a bush somewhere without uh, weapons um it is a concern of course yes i heard many people say to me when those hercules when the doors at the back that flap thing goes down the ramp and that heat gets you and it's white white and you're just standing there and you think to yourself man you know this heat doesn't get me over sand doesn't get me over perhaps a terrorist wall but 
this is this is just very different from Oatswaring or South Africa. Yeah, so it's that different type of uh, climate up there. The the concrete, uh, the the white uh, um, dust stone. Uh, the roads are made of it. The parking lots are made of it. So so you get this um, sun glare all the time and. And uh, sunglasses was frowned upon. You know, we um, in, in the bush um, at that stage, I didn't wear any glasses. So that's all things that can reflect and uh, and make you a very easy target. Um, you taller than um, your troops. Um, you walk amongst the first three or four. Um, if you're now going to wear sunglasses or glasses, it's um, it makes you western and. Um, might be the appropriate target at the time if you were the enemy. I actually asked Colonel Van der Merwe about this, your former commander. Whether your people as, as white people mean but taller and, you know, your big people being South African, uh, were you ever targeted? Were the terrorists, like, trying to shoot you deliberately? I think he said to me, no, he's not aware of that. But would you people ever feel that, man, I might be the target here? Um, I, I don't think so, but but I know that that's a universal concept. Is that if you take out the leadership, um, you immediately in a in a strategically better uh, advantage. So if you if you operate mobilely, like on on a on a Casper, if you Kufut or one hundred one or something like that, the, the enemy knew where the commander was of the vehicle. Um, for him to find out which vehicle was the commander was probably first prize, but any any vehicle, you know where the commander is. And it's the same applied to us. And if you're walking or tracking or chasing or something like that, then you know the leadership has got to be somewhere um, in the front to make uh, that decision. Uh, I don't think there's an army in the world that, that would say, okay, you guys go, I'll be right behind you. You know, that just doesn't work. So would you consider the 3 one Battalion to be more like a mechanized unit or was it an outright infantry unit with some vehicles? So the the the, the unit, um, we, we spoke previously about um, every unit is unique on, on, on what its mandate is and, and, and what troops it's got and what the, the, the troops are uniquely um, trained to do. So initially with our when the unit started, obviously it was Savannah, it was like conventional and the Bushman and the, and the other guy knew that the lay of the land, there were some linguistic advantages and things like that as well, being able to speak Portuguese and so on. But then um, the, the theater of war changed to Zambia where it was a lot of um, walking, um, patrols, smaller patrols, and then you know, when when mines started um, entering the the theater of war, the the Unimog with the sandbags started, and then the event of the Buffalo, and then in in my years, definitely the, uh, no Zambian ops, and we were deployed as as you know already uh, JMC, and then they after the Romeo Mike um, strategy that uh, that three one uh, was involved in so then it was um walking as well lots of foot patrols but then also a lot of chasing on on vehicles um to do the follow-ups and to the enemy would bombshell and we would leapfrog and try and get ahead of them and um and try and pick up a fresher spur so that you bring it within an hour yes i believe it was ziggy last night when we were recording the, what I re refer to as the free to battalion old boy speak, uh, we, because they had like I had a whole bunch of you there, and they were telling us about it just in general terms. But it was Ziggy who actually said he thinks that three one battalion is a unit in the security forces who brought out first this idea of leapfrogging ahead and not the police unit Kufut. Now, I don't know if that is true, and I'm sure a lot of you people are now going to start typing nasty letters. Uh, that's fine. If you guys know it, if we're wrong, we're wrong, and we will deal with it. It's not a problem. Contact us so that we can speak about it. But yeah. can you tell us quickly what is meant by a leapfrog uh, movement? 
Okay, so um, I can only speak for my unit. I wasn't in Kufut or any other other, other unit. So when I did my orientation, uh, Captain Swazi Nodia, uh, when I was introduced to him, and and he was my orientation officer commander of of the orientation phase that uh, my intake had. Uh, we were led to believe that he is the the doyen and the father of the 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 Romeo Mike concept of, of leapfrogging and going ahead and and um, while you'll split your team, so say fifty percent stays on the old spur, um, whatever selected vehicles will go left and right, and um, like an impi, the Zulu impi would. Um, go around the enemy left and right, um, say a kilometer, three, four, and pick up either the same spoor or fresh spoor, or even if there was a, another bombshell in between there, if they start splitting individually, pick up the best spoor. Uh, the radio communication will come back. Okay, guys, you can abandon the old spoor. We've got the fresh ones up here. So you, you, you're working on time, though. Um, so you're just trying to make the, the spoor as fresh as possible the whole time. If there's other units that's uh, or other um, Romeo Mike teams then that, that are in your close vicinity, you can give them coordinates and they can follow, say they split three, two, and you decide to chase the three, they can chase the other two, you know, that kind of thing. So it's it's happened that there was more than one team chasing Spur and then deflecting off and, and doing their own thing. It was one of your commanders, Colonel Brian Adams. It's fascinating to me how these things always get together. The more you speak to people, and that's why I'm so grateful that the people are coming to Legacy, so that we can get from the outside, that we can get like a full picture as far as it's possible, of course, in in life. And Colonel Adam said to me that they sent some of your Bushman people to the South African Army tracking school, which was a bit weird to me why they would need to go. And then they had some problems there because they would not follow the spur. They would run to where they think these guys are going to be uh, in the future. And the trainees or, or the trainers, the instructors just couldn't understand what they're doing and how they're doing it and why they're doing it because they're not from the regiment. They don't understand probably the Bushman way of thinking. So it seems to me that you people introduced this at the tactical level where you would try to figure out what the terrorist is going to do and then just go there and get hold of him. Yeah, so I, I think as as lost as what a, a bushman would be in in um, in New York City, so much we are lost when when we are in the bush. So the way I experienced it is that the bushman has a has a fourth or a fifth dimension of where you would walk and where you would place your foot in the bush. Why would you walk underneath the Arkansas tree if there is a, a way around the tree? And he would see a corridor a kilometer away of where a person would walk while you would focus on five or ten meters in front of you and, and see this, the, the short-term route and then walk into a problem. Right, either a donga or a shona or or trees or bush or something. So they had this ability to see, let's call it, into the future of the of the bush. And uh, and and I know that at a at a stage, uh, KZN um, Nature Conservation sent some trackers from from um, from Natal to um, not necessarily teach tracking, but to come and show us the skills that they've got. And I know that uh, Koki Leroux was also the, the head of our, um, our tracking. It's just when I left, I had the, the fortune of, of meeting Koki just before I, I left. And, um, and I know that there was, there was trainers trying to, to teach the Bushmen, and, and they would do an elaborate starting point and then go on a dog leg around, and then they would say to the Bushmen, okay, there's this guy, he's uh, got a side arm, and um, here's the starting point. You can start tracking him from here. And the astonishment and the amazement in the question and the, and the order that he received, he said, but why would we do that? Because he's sitting over there under the tree there. You can't see him, but I know he's sitting there because he's already seen this fourth dimension of you can only go one place. You 
cannot go, okay, there's a few options, but there's only one place um, that, that you could be. You know, at, at a stage we were, you know, food was always a thing. We had uh, pump action shotguns issued, um, and uh, we would sometimes go for um, like a, a fowl or a guinea fowl or something like that, and you'd shoot that and it would fly, it doesn't fly far, and then a dive bombs and... And if you and I had to look for it, of course, we would be busy in the in the bush there, in the dense bush for a month trying to find this bird. But they instinctively know where the animal has gone down and and either a circle route or something like that, very, very um, elementary. And uh, within a, a minute or two, you would find a needle in a haystack. Now, with those skills come... Rob or for new people, the white people, the, the leadership. Oh yeah, sure. A, a little bit. I could, I could see somebody, somebody walking next to me, and that's about the, the, the end of it. Yeah. Okay, but let's start at the beginning. I know you spoke about this before at our old Mona, um episode, but we don't know if, if the viewers here necessarily saw that one. And if you didn't, please go and have a look. It's really fascinating to hear a guy speak. But what happens once you arrive here to Miecha and they tell you, right, you're not going into the into the base proper, you're not going to get your white linen and your non-commissioner bar and uh, officer's pop. No, no, you guys are staying outside in the bush. So so what happens during that phase? Oh, so, so we didn't know about it. Uh, I, I think if the guys knew that there was a, a, a hell, a two-week hell waiting for them, um, before they could enter the unit, I think a lot of guys might not have opted to go to uh, Amiga. Um, but obviously, it, was, it wasn't it was something that was advertised. And, um, yeah, it was, you know, that once again, that, that feeling of, uh, you know, where's my family? Where's my mom? Where's my dad? You know, how can this be happening to me? Here we go again, you know. And 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 walking at night in, in that rain, it rains all the time. And... It was. I remember the the time that we were doing it, uh, December '84. Um, it was dark moon, and um, there was obviously because it was the old Alpha camp. There was holes dug, you know. There was a oh Ashata and and things like that. And we walked in a stick. I think we were like four guys or something, and we fell into this hole like a swimming pool, you know. Uh, that kind of thing. And and you were wet and you were hungry and you were tired and, and you know, you just want to, you just want to clock out the whole time and so on. But because of the, the year training that you've already done, you've done basics at Uppington, you've done basics again at infantry school. Well, the whole year is, is virtually basics. Um, so uh, sleep deprivation and that kind of thing is, is part of the training so that you can make fairly good decisions when you are chased by the enemy for three or four days. That's another thing we must talk about is the ability to fix Pabvila in, in a question of minutes because you're being chased. And you can – I've had a, a Samuel on it, um, which has got a lot of wheels, just on some of the wheels um, – and they can't turn as sharply as the smaller vehicles. They get stuck between trees. But you make a plan to get them out of out of a situation where um, you don't have time to fix flat tires. Yeah. So, so yeah, to come back to the orientation, it was just uh, I, I did elaborate on the previous episode on my personal experience with the with the orientation. But yeah, it's a. It's, it, I think it, if it was known beforehand. Uh, there would have been lesser volunteers for, for the unit. Yes, I think you guys said to me, you start walking, and we think 35 kilometers, 3-5. My wife says I can't say the word 30 properly, which is true. I don't, you know, English is not my first language at all. So, but yeah, you started off with this walk of 35 kilos, and from there on, it just went on and on and on. And it's warm, I suppose. Okay. Yeah, so so uh, you must remember that the 35 kilometer induction march um, was was something for everyone to be done. If you were in the other musterings, um, if you wanted the unit badge, um, you must do the 35. But you must remember for us that came from infantry school as the leader group of the unit. Our 35 was much different than the other guys' 35. We had full kit 
um, lots of extra things to carry, and our time limitation was was different. Um, so it was it was the end of our orientation was the mere formality of look we could do 70 at that stage um, while 35 for for another mustering might be a particular challenge but for us we could go on for days at that stage and it was just a formality at the end of the orientation to get your crow badge um, the 35 but as I said we were probably doing 30 every day then leading up to the 35 so it wasn't a big thing for us but yeah we had a lot of extra to carry and and we were doing it in a in a in a in a sharp sense, while the other guys would be on the on the background type of thing. But okay, the, so you, you guys were doing it tactical. Yes. You would be carrying your weapons, what you would do on a patrol, things like that. Correct. Uh, you. Um, it was basically pack up all your things that you had at orientation and get to the base, but you've got to do 35 Ks in between. Now. But tell me, uh, Andre, is it possible for you to be denied your crow? Badge your unit emblem if you should uh, misbehave, perhaps get drunk in the pop and uh, you know do something which the colonel doesn't like. Can they take away this badge of yours? Uh, I can't uh, speak from experience. If if you had rank and and you and you opted to misbehave, yeah, they uh, probably be easier to take some of your stripes away. But some of the other guys might enlighten us on on. Um, the giving and the taking of, of the badge. I've heard that you people, once you've done the selection of yours, I'm going to call it a selection. I know you guys talk about orientation, but it is a selection because some people will not make it. And if they don't make it, I suppose they, they go back where they come from. They're not, they, they, they won't stay on in the unit. But what happens at right at the end? I've heard a story that the officer commanding would actually arrive to put the uh, um, ranks onto the officers and the RSM would, in his most kindly fashion, as far as an RSM can be a kind person, um, put your own stripes on you, which looked different, wasn't it? It wasn't the same chevrons of a South African army. Uh, initially, it, it was the same when the when the when it was still three one battalion and the beret the the the, the neutral beret was worn with the the crow emblem. On there, uh, you had your crow, crow badge on your pocket, and then the ranks would be the same. It would be the chevron stripes of the South African uh, Defence Force. But then, when it changed to Southwest African Territory Force, and the Bonnie came in, and so on, then the the chevron stripe turned into a, a straight a straight line. And um, you've already had rank, so you just change the the, the look of of the rank when you when you finished your orientation. But you're correct in saying it was a selection process. So. If you're a young incumbent NCO or officer from infantry school, your likeliness to to operate in the theater of war, some of the guys were much happier taking a back seat. And so it was a selection process where uh, the leadership of the of the orientation phase would say A, B, and C is appropriate. They can go to the companies and and um, take over a team or whatever the case might be. And I'm sure there was some kind of a grading done. Um, that's the way I um, actually um, saw it. So they would obviously have their number one and their, and their tail enders uh, in allocating them to companies and, and to deploy immediately. Was there any feeling for your feeling sorry for the guys who was coming off to you now was to to also go through this process, you feel sympathy for them. Oh, uh, of course, of course, and and even when the when the guys do deploy and and they get graded again um, by their peers and by the le leadership, um, every everybody in in the companies at a at a time you would we would um, deploy for six weeks um, in theory and return to base for six weeks for retraining, replenishment, relaxation at RTB and all that. Lachle and all the other good things that I can't So, um, so that, that was um, how we normally operated. But sometimes your, the, the current team that's operational would be stuck in a shauna and that's a horrible thing to have. 
the helicopters would fly you out and you would um, and the new team would be flown in or driven in by some or walk in and receive cars that are logged down to the diffs in a shauna and they take days and days to try and get them out that, that must be or never luckily it never happened to me but um, I know of teams that that um, deployed into this absolute horror of um, having four or five cars stuck in the in in the, in a shauna um, yeah the, it, it, it ends wet and it starts wet and, and it can probably only get better when you say the word car, you actually mean a Buffalo or a Casper. Yeah, so so mo most of the of the motorized, um, I know that the, the Kufuts also referred to the vehicles as cars and 101 and so on. So you, you had to get on your car and go. So that's the thing. Oh yes, to come back to the to the selection and the and the grading of the leadership. So I I was a particularly bad boy and um I had um lots of reasons to be to be never deployed and just to stay in base. And, and each company had a, um, a chance for either an officer or a, or an NCO. Uh, we call it a lane looper. So um, our bases were, um, there was different companies and all the Kimbos, which is the wooden um, structures that the troops were stayed in, was, was built in some kind of a, 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 a lane. So we had to walk the lines and make sure that the, that the the troops that remained behind for whatever reason were taken care of, that the wives and the children were taken care of. We had to do the mother and the fathering and make sure that the, the HQ is in good nick. We did comms with our um, deployed mates on a, on particular days, uh, either a morning sked or an afternoon sked. We would hear if everything was okay, if there was particular needs, um, then we could go and speak to the QM and, and uh, pre-plan and certain things like that. So everybody had a chance to be a lane looper. And, and some guys, as I said, I should have been a permanent lane looper, but um, some guys stayed behind and they were better suited for that kind of role than actually being um, deployed into the, into the theater. Okay, but if you are deployed, what happens? So uh, being uh, just finishing orientation and then going and, and getting your team, you must remember you're a, you're an 18 year old. Um, well, I was 18, and now you get um, 30 um, hardened veterans that that you have to command. Um, if you're lucky, you have a, a officer with you. Uh, in my case, I was I was given a, a parabat loot. Um, the JMC at that stage was commanded by Colonel Archie Johnson. Uh, 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 sorry, Moore. And um, Archie Moore. And um, he had a, a lieutenant there that was seconded to us. And uh, we took over Alpha Company Platoon 1. And um, it's difficult for you to settle in and, um, and take charge and command of guys that's been in this situation for for eight years, well, cl close to a decade, and uh, you're the rookie, and you want to tell them what to do. It's it, it's a challenge to to make them um, respect and and listen and uh, execute what you think is right with no experience whatsoever. What language do you use, baby? Well, Afrikaans was the, the spoken language. Uh, um, most of the guys, a few words of English, but um, during the, the Joint Monitoring Commission, because you, you're operating with FAPLA, there was a FAPLA uh, contingent uh, on a gas or a uro or something, and we were, we were walking side by side or driving side by side with them. Um, uh, you picked up on the, on the Portuguese, uh, fala Portuguese very quickly. And uh, but just some words, but most, most Afrikaans was spoken, so we could speak, and the Portuguese wouldn't necessarily understand us, but they can speak, but our guys could still understand them. Um, their rats were superb, you know, it was thin peaches from Holland, and they had cigarros, and they had um, tin sardines in olive oil. Yeah, I'll never forget, and 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 jugs and jugs of olive oil. So we had to to trade uh, travel car with these guys all the time. They they obviously liked our food as well, 
but um, they had particularly good quality rations. Yeah, that would be the Cubans who were deployed by Castro there for a uh, duration, I suppose. Yeah, so that was obviously the logistical uh, the logistical um, uh, point that uh, they they got these fantastic rations. Uh, they weren't packed very well. They they came in boxes and things like that. A lot of it was, um, you know, not like our rat packs that was properly packed and issued and things like that. So, um, but yeah, when when we did encounter a spur with the JMC and and we made an extended line, we're now following spur. Um, these guys were holding back. You know, it was obviously their buddies, so they tried to frustrate us as much as possible. Um, in that time, there was a there was a few contacts, and um, if if things um, became hot, these guys were hands on their grenades, and you you weren't sure if the grenade was necessarily going to go forward. It might go side, or even to the back. So um, yeah, we had to um, keep your head on a on a spindle to um, operate side by side with these guys. Uh, their vehicles were great. We had lots of problem with our vehicles, with river crossings and things like that, seeing that they're smaller. But, you know, these um, powerful Russian trucks, look kind of before sleep. And obviously they, their vehicles broke down as well, but um, there was always um, somebody that, around that, that, that could fix something. But the buffalo was never supposed to be used in the great numbers it was used. I believe even the designers of it said this was supposed to be a stopgap until they could get a properly designed vehicle because a buffalo is nothing but a unimog with a armored cap and an armored um, back on it to deflect the landmines. There, there is a, a elaborate story on, on Facebook at the moment uh, that the chap in South Africa that I just forget his name at the moment. He's writing a whole story about the development of the of the um, the buffle. So it's a it's a Mercedes product that um, uh, he tells a story where he got into trouble um, about branding and things like that and changing certain things. It's it's quite nice to read. So yeah, the. the Look, the before was was fantastic. It was a nimble. I drove past many many cuspers that was that was stuck. But then again, they had superior speed and 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 they had nice momentum to to go through the bush, Bosbriek, as we know. Many times that I've chased poor that one hundred one would come past or Kufud would come past and and take our spurs. Uh, there was obviously I, I there's a story about the financial reward for 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 Kufud to to get the kills and, and things like that. But, you know, then then you you do your best. So we were limited in our speed and things like that. But there were other situations that I saw four Caspers in a Shauna and we would come past, you know, that that kind of thing. So um, each each unit had its, had its own um, advantages and, and the limitations. The the problem, and, and as you... You hear me say before, Mupani Verum snakes and, and leaves. So there, there's a certain seasons in Novemberland and southern Angola where there's lots of animals in the trees. And obviously when you um, – and, and this is another thing. The, the defense leadership was quick to say sometimes, look, you must quickly go there and establish an a LZ for the choppers. But you're not allowed to go on the road. So we would – as I said, with the Bushmen, they could see this fourth, di third dimension or whatever uh, in, in the bush. And uh, we would do the most appropriate road as fast as possible. But uh, a lot of it, we had to stay off roads, off tracks, because that's where the mines and the and the, and the booby traps would be, the pomzets and the dootskasis and, and things like that. So you would bunker down, heads down, and you would um, go through all these uh, Mupani shrubs. So the buffalo would fill up with leaves up till about your ankles or even, even higher than that. And when you're not looking and everybody's going now, you must remember this is how can stick. It's thorns and things like that. You can't dare wear a headdress. We're hanging, hanging in a tree there um, for, for the, the, rest, the, the remainder of the time there. So we had to hunker down and lots of times a snake would fall into the buffle in the back. Now, Bushmans are, are very superstitious people. 
um, stokkogers, jy mag hulle nie sien nie, because God intended that you're not allowed to see a stokkoger. So even if you see it, you're not allowed to acknowledge that you've seen it. Um, like a van or a monitor, it's a devilish kind of creature. It, uh, lo and behold, you don't go close to that animal. And the snake is the same. It's 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 a bad spirit. So um, we would, after this tree experience where we, you would go through the Arkan Steak and the Mupani and so on, you would find a water hole and we would um, this and Mark do um, rondom verdediging and uh, guys were allocated with their water bottles to fill up um, if I remember correctly, a buffalo had a 200 litre diesel tank and a 100 litre um, water tank in the belly, belly of the V where the troops would sit at the back so we would fill up the water and one bushman would always be in, in a vehicle as part of looking out, but he'd also be eating or something like that. And he'll be fiddling below his seat with to try and find his food or whatever he was trying to do. But when he yells and he jumps off the buffalo without touching it onto the ground, so I jump and shouts, um, Satan, Satan, then you must know that there's a snake inside the vehicle. Now, they would disappear. You wouldn't see a, a bushman in, in a kilometer. They'd be hiding somewhere. And one of our guys would have to go in, and now you'd go suk stiek for the snake. And uh, in a buffalo filled with uh, leaves, uh, green leaves, and it's a green snake, it's not an easy, it's not an easy task. And of course, you can't shoot this night there because it's an armored vehicle. A bullet will just bounce back to you. Yeah, you're going to have to be um, expecting the ricochet. So that was a disadvantage of, of the very much open. Casper's a bit, uh, bit narrower on the top, but they also had their ingress of, of, of things. They had the, the, the doors open at the back, and I know of that one incident where RPG entered the back of the of the of the Casper through the open door. So both vehicles had certain surround defenses and um and if the doors are open, the doors are open. And if something falls in the top, it falls in the top. And um and uh, so once again advantages, disadvantages to some to some of the vehicles. If we can come back to the um to the snake snake part that falls into your vehicle is that um the source of food once again. So the Bushmans were always tracking something to eat. And uh, a flak fark is a dangerous animal. If it storms out of a hole and it gets hold of your leg or your ankle or something like that, most of the time the muscle would be torn off or you would lose your leg or something like that. So that was an interesting hunt. The other thing was obviously snakes, and we'll we'll post a picture of a of a of a lace lung, a considerable lace lung that um, Andre Woodendall and myself ate at one stage with with our team. And uh, catching a, a a python in a hole is also a, a, there's a technique to it which the Bushmen perfected, and um, gathering of honey. But the other thing is um, a monitor, a, a lucker van. Now. A look of on would um, is difficult to see and it will crawl up a tree and it will sit on the sunny side because it's a reptile. So in the day, it wants to get maximum heat. So it's usually on the sunny side. But then when you do see one and you have to get it out of the tree, which is like a dead tree, you can't really climb it. And no Bushman would in his right mind climb up and try and grab it because this is the devil himself. So you would look around for something to throw, and Uvambu land doesn't have stones. So you had to look around for um, um, sticks, you know, that's fallen off trees, and sizable thick ones, because a monitor has got claws like this, and it's not an easy animal to dislodge from a tree. So we would spend some time throwing tucker sticks, because there's no rocks. Um, at this animal, and when it does loosen itself and it falls to the ground, once again, no bushmen in sight. They disappear, they evaporate, and um, the leadership will have to go and knock this animal at least unconscious or, or kill it, and then the bushmen would do their thing. They uh, Snakes and, and monitors go the same way. It's a, a you, you disembowel the animal and take the skin off and boil the meat and fry the fat 
and that accompanied with some millipup uh, makes for quite quite a feast in in um, in the Overland region. So does it taste like chicken? Is that story true? Yeah. So um, all all those meats they um, they taste the same. Even chicken in a Vamberland, which is uh, another animal we all tell you about, it tastes like chicken. Um, uh, Uvam is the most um, successful marketing story known to man. It's a big animal like this. It's a sizable chicken, and you're willing to pay at that stage two rand or five rand or whatever, or trade something for it. But once you've plucked its feathers, man, oh man, it's like a mossy. There is nothing left. It's, it's the smallest little bird of biblical proportions it's a small animal and uh, it's not not as big a chicken as what you thought it was and tough so there would be like a trading going on between you guys and the locals if you arrive with your vehicles at the crawl uh, or you see some of the locals around perhaps I uh, think the local yeah, the local population after years and years of war, they was, I think they were emotionally, you know, in, in a horrible place because, as I said, Fapla would come along, Swapu would come along, Kufut will come along, 101 will come along, the uh, Pathfinders would come along, everybody, and um, have the same story. Swapu Lipin, did you, have you seen the enemy? Where's the enemy? All that kind of thing. Um, but you would obviously trade because there was there was food. So uh, just before I I must just make a note. Of it. Um, we found in some regions of of southern Angola that because the, the the bushmen were small nomadic people that they would and they were isolated. The the big tribes were broken up. The Portuguese government, um, as as the, the country was in a revolution, there was no real police force or any any government that could that could um, safeguard the existence of, of the bushmen. And we would come to Vambu crawls where the um, where the Kwanyama people were were, um, were were stronger and um, had more resources, where they would actually enslave. A family of of uh, bushmen. We would we would come to the to the um, external part of the crawl. Uh, there was a certain way to approach this uh, safely, and we would find a very small hut, not more than a meter or a half, uh, raised above the of above the sand. And the first time I've experienced it, and the bushmen would go in and and speak their language, and out of this little hut. May just with sticks and bark and, and leaves and things. Uh, the seven bushmen would appear. It would be the, the, the mother, uh, maybe an older son, some of the daughters, some of the younger boys. Uh, the dad might have died or he's been elsewhere. And this family would work um, and, and be kind of like slaves of, of, the, of the, the tribes, the other tribes. And then... You know, you have to bornstone um, the the retribution aspect from our troops that had the military advantage of rifles and bullets. Um, we had to really uh, try and calm them down, not to revenge um, the fate of 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 the the bushman slaves. There, there there was a lot of raucous going on, and. Um, and when we left, what's the situation that we leave them in again? Is it just the same thing again? That they, they've got no other recourse but to, to work for this family, to get a handful of, 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 um, of a meal and maybe something to eat and, and a safer place to stay. So th that was the unfortunate uh, realization of, of the life in the crawl. But that happened on, on, on a few occasions that we saw that. Um, obviously, chickens were traded and, um, and also burbok. So one, one incident, uh, at a crawl, usually they had wells. Uh, it was just a rudimentary Y stick with a, with a handle and a rope and a bucket. And uh, there was usually quite a few wells dug, uh, anything up to about 20 wells. And um, the, the seepage of the water would go into the well and um, some were dry and some were fairly deep. And uh, the bushmen would walk around the crawl and investigate and they heard this bleating of this, um, 
Burbok uh, coming from down in one of the wells. So we opened it up and a bushman went down and we hauled out this with a rope around his chest because he was the smallest. I wouldn't have fit in the well. I'm, I'm six foot 60, so I can't get, get down there. Um, and up he came with a hairless, because uh, that burbok was down there for about a week or two and all the hairs fallen out and it was this like albino bookie that we bought out there. And needless to say, the the um, the tribal chief was very happy. We got the book and they were looking for it. And uh, a few rands passed hands and uh, we had a, a fine dinner that night. Waterbok, I think it was called or something like that. But yeah, once again, very tough meat. And a very distinctive smell and, and taste to it, yeah. So when you prepare this meat, would it be done in the traditional Bushman way if there's such a thing, or would it be like a barbecue, which all of us understand a bit better? Yeah, so the, the traditional way of, of, of um, preparing the meat for them was, was boiling. Um, and um, there wasn't a big distinction between afal and the normal boil. So And water was scarce. So when the, the stomach was open, there was a lot of shaking going on to get most of the, the stomach guts out. And then the, the bit of water that could have been um, recycled in or used to clean it somewhat. But it's not the, the offal that your, your mom or your family made when you were growing up. Um, it, was, uh, it was of the, the, the more alive kind. So... You know, when when an animal was was killed, usually you had to um, you had to do it fairly quickly. Um, we were obviously a motorized unit like ourselves had lots of um, drums that was either um, filled with oil or some kind of uh, mechanical uh, fluid that were, that was in there. So we always had a few extra drums, but uh, the drum was always, when it was empty, it was always prepared by burning it inside and out to get the plastic form off and so on. So the, the Bushmen were usually always prepared with a cooking drum. And a fire would be made and all the pieces and the afal, everything would be chopped up and into the pot and pop would be made. And um, then we would probably move because remember, there's a smell and an activity towards us. So you couldn't stay on one place too long. And then we would probably move and uh, make a dog leg eventually, get a few kilometers away and then eat and then move again and things. So you, you had uh, household, but you always had a, a, a tactical experience in, 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 in the background. Obviously, our guys, we always asked for like a boat or a rubiki or something like that, that we could pry on a buffalo's grill was always burnt, the paint off and so on, and we could pry on the, on the grill. Uh, once it's cold enough, you can put the grill back on the, on the vehicle and, and then carry on. But, um, and then obviously the, the intestines were buried, you know, the, the things that couldn't be eaten, which was very little. Um, the, like the skin and the puikis and the things were, were buried. And um, there was one incident I remember clearly where we where we had a, a, I don't know if it was a, a tolly or something, but it was a, a, a sizable um, animal. And we buried this and we also did our dog leg that night. The wild dogs or the dogs of the crawls or something were following the the. The, the, the smell of, of this food. And obviously, if there's a lot of meat left, you would we would try and make biltong and things like that. But being very hot and humid and so on, it was it was very difficult. I remember having a a, a bock leg, a hindquarter in the back of my, my buffalo's um, bin at the back. And at the bottom, you'll have the larva forming, you know, the, the fly lar larva at the back. And then you would just cut that off until you get to the to the wet meat where it's acceptable. And it used to, you cut that off, take a slice, bry it, and uh, three or four days it would last like that until you just couldn't take it anymore. There was nothing left. But that was our fridge in the bush. Yeah, just cut the, the flea lava off and, and get to the, the meat that's not busy rotting. But anyway, to come back to the story, the dogs were following us, were quite a big pack of, so we were lying in the TV that night and, um, and uh, these dogs were yapping and so on. So 
despite the fact that we couldn't sleep, we were then becoming a bit agitated because if the dogs are making a noise, we could be reft at any moment. And if you heard a doom, 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 you know it's coming, you know. So, so we had antennas at, we fitted some antennas at the back of our vehicle sometimes because you had a day frequency and a night frequency. So my vehicle had a day antenna and a night antenna. And um, while we were driving, we could easily make comms. And at that stage, I think Neil Besengout was there, uh, Gene Waits and Andre Udendal uh, with some of the officers. We were all together. And um, I think it was, I think it was Neil Besengout or Andre Udendal. So we had a, a HK21. It's a, it's a, a LMG. It's a, um, a very fast firing, unforgiving, um, small little um, m uh, machine gun and a belt fed and um, got onto the vehicle and he did a nice salvo, just like a, a 180 in the direction of the dogs, nice and high as not to, to shoot the tubes lying on the ground, sleeping. And um, the dogs were gone. Um, but everybody was awake, great consternation and everything like that. Okay, guys, it's fine now. Go back. And, and the next morning, the first light, we saw that he shot off two of the antennas as well off the vehicle. So it, it was a, that was a, um, succeeded in, in, in one aspect of getting the dogs away and then uh, destroying some equipment in the, in the process. But yeah, it, 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 uh, feeding yourself and, uh, where you bury the, the the intestines and where you're going with the food and so on is always a, a an important consideration. You know, you talk about superstition. I haven't heard many, but in the police, I had a superstition that if one of our constables, black or white, normally black, if they start urinating on a Casper's tire, that tire is going to go flat for some reason. And it really takes, as I always say in my books as well, about two constables and an angry sergeant to get that wheel changed. So I have to ask you, because I've heard that you people who could change wheels on a buffalo like nothing you've seen before. Uh, is, is that rumor true? What, the, the fact that we can change tires fairly quickly? Yes, in uh, the felt. Yeah, I think all, all the units, um, I, I think the Casper tires, I had a, a ring and you had to pull the pin of the ring and it was a different system, a, a, a defelling it, I, it was split in two and things. I, I was solid rim. So when the when the tire became flat, you had to drive one vehicle. If it, if you were on your own, it was difficult. But if you had another vehicle, you put the, or a vehicle that can drive over the, the tire and it would unlock the beading and you would put a new tube in, and um, then with um, with uh, tire levers, get the tire back on again, inflate it, um, you know, uh, that, uh, the, the normal kind of thing. And uh, we would usually wait until there's, because if you had to stop, you had to stop for a, a good reason. I wait until in, amongst the cars, there's about three or four or five uh, flat tires. And normally a buffalo has one, um, one tire, but I know in occasions where the guys actually took extra extra rims, tires and everything with exactly for this reason. And um, and if you were fortunate enough to have a sawmill operating with you, then obviously more more tires. But um, but tubes and 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 uh, the, the tire itself was always um, uh, things that that our unit could uh, affirmatively purchase when we got to the logistical bases, there was always tires missing that the guys hated us because between us and the other Romeo Mike units and so on, everybody was looking for, for parts and, and things and tools. And, and so it was our, in most of the bases, we weren't even allowed to enter. If they said the bush one were here, you guys go and sleep on the Ashat. You're not even allowed to come and have a beer in the bar or anything like that. Um, but yeah, I had a, I had a driver and the driver, a Bushman driver, and his name was Feiferand. And on a good day, when he didn't knock too many troops unconscious in the back of, of the vehicle with his driving, he would be Feiferand. But on a bad day, when we were close to rolling over or somebody knocked his head senseless because he went through Dongas and Erdfarkat and, and stuff, then he would be 50 cents. So um, Feiferand's name changed according to his driving ability. But did that happen often? Did it happen that the buffalo could overturn? 
A buffer on a tar road at speed is a dangerous thing. Uh, it gets a body roll like most, um, I believe, a rattle does. And and uh, if I think if you go fast enough in in, in anything made of of panzer stall, then then a body roll and and things like that is 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 a is a concern. Uh, but mostly the the speeds we were traveling at was crawling or you know our, uh, the, the, none of our vehicles ever. Um, rolled over because of a, uh, as I said, rocks you only find in the west there at Rokana going into the into the uh, the mountainous part there. But the rest and the east and the central November land, um, Shauna's Shauna's uh, waterlog Shauna's was was our biggest concern. You would um, at one stage we had a Dumini um, deploying with us. I don't know how we could afford to actually take a Dumini with us, but he was he wanted to fight, so we issued him with uh, a chest webbing and and uh, I think he had an R four, and um, he he wanted to see the action. And uh, I remember um, we had some Samal hundreds with us as logistic vehicles, and he was particularly. Um, I wouldn't say lazy, but he didn't want to go to the extra trouble of of getting himself a bivy made in the in the night to sleep. And remember, it was raining most most nights uh, sometimes, and sometimes also cold. So there was reason to put up a bivy. He decided no, he's going to take his sleeping bag and and um, sleep underneath the que one hundred uh, the uh, the panzer panzer que and. Um, Obviously, um, being soft sand, waterlogged, and and weighing 20 tons at least, um, this vehicle was doing what Mother Nature intended with gravity. It was slowly sinking away in the Shauna. And I remember waking up to his groans, help me, help me. And uh, I think he had a diff or something that was already... Um, onto his chest, and we and and he was a big fella, and we had to pull him free of the vehicle that night. He got stuck underneath the while sleeping underneath the the quayful. Um But yeah, as I said, Shauna's. Um, I was I was in a in a Shauna where it was hard clay, and um, you could start the buffle, and you could engage fourth gear, high range, two wheel drive or four wheel drive. And you can do 80 kilometers per hour and the vehicle is stationary and standing like that. Then you can take your hand in the front of the vehicle and, and push it backwards while it's doing 60 kilometers per hour on the clock. Because it's 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 so muddy, it's so slippery that it's got absolutely no traction. To push the vehicle is easier than to, than to try and drive it. it. It just does nothing. I just want to quickly go back, Andre on flat wheels because it's sandy bed as you said how do you get those jackson things to not sink into the sand while you're trying to get that wheel changed oh that, that's another thing of umberland doesn't have stone so to to proper jack up underneath a diff or something like that you need wood so if 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 we didn't have a prepared block from a L, LV at, at five one five two or five three battalions where you would go and, and draw your kit, um, or you haven't stolen one from Inana or Umbalantu or wherever, then your jack is going to sink away into the sand. So usually uh, you made a plan. You could use a spade or something as a base plate and, and um, an upturned spade, and then uh, jack your wheels and so on. But um, when a guy, uh, the, the Uvambu, um, starts building his, his crawl, he, he takes a lot of the saplings of the tree and he cuts it with his machete and he cuts it at a 45 degree angle. And that becomes the crawl wall and it becomes the crawl houses and, and, and the roof structure and things like that. So on the perimeter of the, of the crawl, there's a, a thousands of 45 degree sharp saplings that's either under the sand or just out of the sand or so. And if you don't know how to approach a crawl and you would drive into this area where these things are, they were particularly nasty in, in cutting cutting wheels and, and, and things like that. Um, but other than that, the, the tires were okay. There was one particular trait that was that was uh, favored, uh, uh, superstitiously favored by the Bushmen. So we had to get this one kind of tire. Um, the other ones, they say, "Now I come for a pop bill here." So um, 
urinating on a tire or choosing a tire thread that would determine the, the amount of possible punctures that you might have on a on a vehicle. No problems with overheating. Oh, lots. You know, the same amount of snakes and leaves that fall into the into the biffle falls onto the the manifold. And uh, I would drive with my water bottle at hand. And when the smoke became too much that I couldn't breathe, some of the dry leaves or something that gets embedded with the with the manifold outlet, um, there was a, a just a design that the leaves can't fall through. They lie on top of this. The vehicle was working hard enough and we weren't doing a forward speed where it could cool then it would the fire there's, there's a fire on the manifold so uh, then water a bit of water over it to try and get it or you take a stick and you you try and uh, scratch it off the the manifold that you that you can do and and another thing with our units because we we were sometimes deployed so so far away from from the cup lane and from resources, logistical resources, if we hit the mine or a vehicle broke down, we had to do our own recovery. So what we would do if the, the one buffle on the battery box, we would reverse the other, other buffle chassis on top of the, the battery box, take this one's battery out, and then K, uh, with chains, we would chain the, the vehicle together and then um, pull it on its front wheels. Or even the other way around, we had to do a lot of, um, there's one particular photo that we would post that I had a, a wishbone um, connecting two vehicles uh, that you would tow with, um, permanently connected to my to my vehicle. Now, that's another design fault of the Biffle, if we can come back to the Biffle, is that uh, the ladders, the side ladders that you would climb up onto the Biffle, those are the first, first things that go. Um, because we're in a bushy area, the, the ladders, they was either bent out of proportion, that the photograph will show. And the other thing is the mud guards. The mud guards had two pipes and then a rubber piece like that. That would be the first thing to go. Um, plastic battery boxes, we told them, please don't give us plastic, back, give us metal. And you had a plastic bin or you had a metal bin. There's another incident of a plastic uh, bin that caught fire and exploded but that's a story for another day um we prefer we preferred the metal bins because they were um they could take the hammering i saw from some of the pictures which you guys have sent to me that you had like it looks like a 30 caliber uh, browning mounted onto the buffalo uh, was that standard or were you guys in the felt just you know, putting things on. Uh, that, that kind of uh, that kind of weaponry was on the on the earlines and so on. The I think it was three hundred three or something like that. Um, but yeah, the, there was interesting weapon attachments. I know the the Kufut guys, pref you know, fiat in favor, and and it and it went big. Um, Neil beside note at one stage in our unit um, did a five o Browning, but a five o Browning and a Buffalo. You know, the power to weight ratio on that configuration is a, the, the 5 Browning rattled the, the buffalo. It's much, much rather on a Casper or something bigger. Um, but we had interesting, my particular vehicle also, we had a V bar at the front to try and proportion the, the, the LMG in the middle of the vehicle because being side mounted or being end mounted particularly um, takes a hammering from the bush. So if the if the LMG made it and the, and the the pivot ensemble that it was in made it, um, you would find that after a, a few hours in the bush that the belt fit belt the the rounds come out of out of sync, and that's where your stoppages would become. Uh, a machine gun doesn't like the rounds not being one hundred percent aligned, and. Um, we would it was one incident where the guys had to take the belts out every every night or and then just make sure that all the rounds and the the one the one guy unfortunately thought it was prudent to use his magazine of his rifle and just tap the the rounds in together obviously one of the rounds did go if you hit it on the sweet spot on, at the back and the shell casing opens up and there was a pot in his hand and obviously a bit of scrubbing with peroxide. Um, he would never do that again. He, he learned his lesson. You take a, either your hands or a soft, 
soft item and try and get the rounds aligned back into the belt. Yeah, that, that's the biggest failure in my experience of a, of a machine gun um, not working is that the, the rounds are out of alignment. So there was a lot of um, R&D going on to try and see, okay, let's get our hands on some other um, weaponry and, and mount it on the vehicles and, and, and see how it works. But the particular disadvantage of the, of the Biffle was there was no center-mounted weapon that had uh, more uh, defenses from the vehicle itself. And because the, the, the guns were mounted either right front or left back, they, um, they experienced a lot of damage and, um, from the trees and the bush. What about dust? No, obviously, you you had to clean and, and oil and, and sand. But once again, in a sandy environment, dusty environment and oil, you know, you can just see things um, going the wrong way. So they were, you always try and uh, to, to balance off the gas setting, more powerful, maybe a bit less oil to compensate for the amount of sand and dust ingress into the weapon. So... Um, it was it was a, a, a touch and go learning experience on on how to but uh, contacts were were so quickly finished you know if you were going to do a belt um, you were lucky um, changing belts um, it, it must have been a, a quite a quite a severe encounter for you to be able to still do that. Should you eat the contact with your D boss or would you been already on the on the ground tracking? Well, that that would uh, depend on the on the circumstances. But usually, when when uh, spurs were followed and we were doing the leapfrog and so on, the guys would say, "Okay, they very close now." But the guys would there be four guys on the on the ground or five guys on the ground, and uh, the rest would be in the in the vehicle. And uh, it, contact from the front, left or right or something like that. The the strategy was always to to drive into the uh, and and uh, when you feel gevecht, put as many as as much as you can down, and it lasted a few seconds. And because that was the tactics of, of of the guys, if they if they wanted to turn around and, and shoot, they would go for the the most obvious target, um, SKS S or, or something like that, uh, you know, a lobber rifle grenade or something like that, and um, then get on their way again because they knew they couldn't loiter, they couldn't stay. If, if they stood their ground, then then the casualties would have been heavy on their side. Because we it was it was always like three or four against maybe twenty five or thirty statistically. I recall in my time it was a lieutenant fires on Fieren in the police at the counter insurgency units. I think he was no decent. Uh, because he couldn't speak of Afrikaans properly. He spoke it with a very heavy accent, but a wonderful man. And I'll never forget, he said to me one day, he said, you know what, Kufut has no fire discipline whatsoever. And I was like, well, say, you're now treading with the angels fear to tread, you know, because these were the, the guys around. And then he started explaining about the double tap and how he would expect people to act and so forth. And he started training us like that. So I have to ask you a fire discipline of your bushmen and yourselves. <clears throat> Sorry, uh, how was that? Uh, how did it go with fire discipline? Well, I, I I think if it if it started and that was the strategy is, is to uh, you know definitely the first magazine was was emptied. There was there was no and then um, if there was a chance to reload and so on. Um, the guys wanted to fire because the motivation they've been running for hours they wanted to lay as much lead as, as possible as can go but as i said it usually lasted only a few seconds and um to hear returning fire from the enemy uh, what's what's the use of you had to stalk fear stalk fear okay and then we do the follow through with the vehicles um and that situation from a follow up on a spur to uh, encountering maybe um, dug in trenches is a is a totally different action whatsoever. The, the one would be a mooi uitgespreide linie in the gaan, but while you're tracking and so on, you'll, and if you're still on the vehicles, you'll go through the contact area and then turn around and come back and then um, do your 
more detailed search to see what the en enemy has dropped or left behind or some intel or whatever they might still be. And uh, Air Force concept support uh, was that available to you guys? Yeah. So if if the if 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 the spur was established and 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 so on like that, then of course, yeah, gun gunships would come in and um, spend as much time as what their fuel allows. We always had a, um, a extra um, helicopter fuel on our vehicles if if the if it was hot enough and they wanted to stay still that we could uh, refuel, but. Um, but yeah, that happened uh, from time to time. That um, the gunships were definitely uh, above us, and we were we were chasing the the, the hot spur. With three one battalion, two hundred one battalion, were you guys ever used in the major operations like uh, Modular or Hooper? Oh, so in, in my particular time in in eighty five and eighty six there there wasn't there was the JMC there was a, some smaller operations but there was in my time not a not a a, a packer and a hooper and a modular and things like that um, the other guys to speak to would be guys that were either before me in Askari or afterwards um, closer to the end of the war where there was major more conf, uh, you know conventional type of encounters. Um, where there was um, ambushes laid for vehicles and things like that. In my time, it was heat, touch and go, and uh, a few spur, and it, and uh, there was lots of times that the official orders was okay. You must get out of here. You're not allowed to be here. And um, and then we would uh, still operate in in certain sec sectors where the leadership thought it was prudent for us to be. But there was certain times where there was a no-go order came through. You're not allowed to go over the cup lane. Yeah, that's a problem with politicians. I believe that um, it's always difficult when I when I say these things because you know we're recording this, and tomorrow uh, General John Harris is talking about his time at command at Free to Battalion. And most certainly, if he didn't refuse the orders which I gave from the head office from Pretoria to the politicians interfering. It is my opinion, and I think many of the general officers actually believe this to be true, Free to Battalion would have ceased to exist in 1987 with Modular. They were, to say the least, flipping insane from head office. They wanted Free to Battalion to stop four Kapla brigades of tanks. And the way they wanted to do it was just insane. And, and, and I think General Jock was quite right to say he will not do it. And of course, we relieved him of his command. By the time you people are listening, uh, this is three, four weeks ago. So if you haven't seen the, uh, the video, please go and have a look at it. So one way Jock Harris speaks about his time of uh, commander of Free to Battalion and what actually happened there. Now, I have to ask you this. Did you ever feel that uh, superior officers were perhaps a bit out of touch and they are just not doing the right things here for the men on the ground? Uh, um, obviously, as I mentioned previously, go and do a job quickly, but you're not allowed to drive on the road. We will never give you permission to drive on the road, but you must get there quickly. So it, it, it's that, that military... Um, Conundrum or contradiction that stayed the, the whole time, and um, obviously with with certain areas, especially when there's um, small teams in an area, you don't and and they they look like the enemy. You don't want to send a Romeo Mike team in on the same on the same area because if they're going to move and the spur is picked up, then there's a, a possibility for for blue on blue deaths. So. Lots of times we worked in an allocation when when we came to the the sector commander he would brief our officers and say okay that, that's your block that's your block that's your block and and we had wigs and we had black is beautiful and we had foreign weapons and we had uh, camo uniforms and we would send in four or five guys to go and lie close to the crawl to see if there's any activity in and out of the crawl. And uh, the next morning, we would um, sweep through the crawl. And on the other side is a pathfinder in a tree. And I said, hello, but how long sit you here? I said, I'm going to go from yesterday. 
say, well, did you see anything in the crawl last night? And so on. And then he says, no, they didn't see any. So, so that was the danger that you would deploy certain forces in a block and they were in your block or I was maybe inadvertently in his block, but certainly not according to my um, air photographs and, and, and uh, mapping. So, yeah, that, that was a danger. And we all know about the, the unfortunate fatalities and injuries that, that was um, inflicted by, by things like that. And that's, that's management and control from higher up. And surely accidents in, in the theater of war happens. But uh, that, that was a, a particular concern of mine, is thinking that you're operating in isolation, but you actually not. And uh, there was a distinct possibility in that situation that we could have taken out a stick of pathfinders or them damaging us, you know, um, hitting our guys going in. So, um, yeah, for sure, that's thing. And then also the, the orders change from time to time. So uh, predominantly we were a, a, like a seek and destroy kind of thing, find and chase. And uh, But at one stage, I think it was 86, there was um, Intel, military intelligence, you know, that it doesn't exist. But anyway, there was intelligence that um, lots of bicycles were used to transport um yeah, recoilers, um, I call it a recoilers rifle, actually. Uh, recoilers um, parts smuggled on bicycles and ammunition and a lot of things coming down. They can see five or six or ten guys on bicycles coming down. So we got in a distinct order that we must, uh, if we see a bicycle, we take the bicycle. And we had vehicles with ten bicycles parked on there. Same with the with the address experience with the Arkansas You would find bicycles hanging in trees for the past five kilometers that we've been driving. And uh, the other thing was, was donkeys also that um, donkeys was used to transport them. And we had to um, accumulate the, the, the donkeys to try and deny the enemy, the, the transport and logistics routes that they were using. And also um, a very, very nice experience is um, the donkey carts. It's a, it's an easy track to follow because it's got two round wheels. And, um, you know, we, I, I was in, in the bush for two Christmases and two birthdays. So um, you, you try and have a festive time during one of those days. And luckily, we picked up this deep inside um, this donkey car going. And we managed to catch up to it. And uh, it was filled with um, tassies, red wine. Obviously, we paid the price and we got two or three bottles of tassies and, and my birthday wasn't too bad at all. And thinking of that, there was one day we, we came across this old gentleman walking with his son, you know, and they've got those rudimentary fellies that they made out of tires and things. He's a, he's a real, uh, you know, uh, local population guy. And he was wearing glasses and we came up to him and we, Malapue, Nawatue, Mbili Nawa, all these things. And this guy replied with the most amazing English. And I was flabbergasted. I said, sir, where did you manage to speak the Queen's English? He said he was in the Second World War. He was in North Africa with the, with the British. And it's experiences like that that really blows your mind in, 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 uh, in, in southern Angola that you would find. I said, but why you all? Where, where did you go? He said, no, I had to go down to, to Oshakati to go and get my spectacles replaced. <laughs> it was absolutely a surreal experience. And I think we gave him a lift. We gave him some food. And what a fantastic gentleman to meet in, in those um, circumstances. Are there any specific things which happened to you where I know yesterday when we spoke to uh, Uncle Bob, your log, loggy, he told about the story when, well, he didn't tell it. He just mentioned he got blown up by a landmine. He, oh, I will still get hold of him, I assure you. He will tell us about it in the future. Uh, but anything specific which happened to you which uh, which you can share with us, perhaps? Oh, so, so as I said, I should have been a permanent landlord, but I was probably the worst soldier ever in the war. And... Um... And, and our unit had a, had a Cracker Jack trophy. I think the Cracker Jack trophy started in uh, Colonel Franz Boetus days, where it was tongue-in-cheek an award for the, the team that 
hit the most mines in probably a, a, a year, a calendar year. And um, Andre Udendal and my the, the first experience, well, I was, I was close to a lot of other mines. You would operate next to another team and boom, you'll see the mushroom and go and help them. And then uh, Kazavak, the vehicles, as I explained before, because it was way too far away for, for TDK to come with a... Um, the white horse or something like that to come and pull the vehicle or with another query recovery or something. To, so we had to, to recover our own vehicles. Um, so I, I, it was on the, on the Zangongo side, there's a small town of Tichipa on the Western side. And um, there was lots of spoor. There was a lot of activity in the place and we knew we were going to, you can feel it, you know, something's going to happen. Um, and uh, it was early in the morning, and uh, we were we were working some spur, and um, Andre Urendal, um was leading the chase, and his vehicle uh, detonated a mine. Uh, he had some ear damage, and uh, uh, Puma came to to Kazavak him, and um, and yeah, it's it's a horrible experience, you know the. The, the fright, um, the damage to your ears, everything singing, even if you're not on the vehicle that, that hits it, but if you're in a close enough e extremity, um, you know, you it's a it's a flashbang experience. So you, you're totally out of your wits. Um, Andre was um, off, or he went off to one mill, I think. And um, we recovered the vehicle and carried on with our, with our task. That was one of the first experiences. And there was a lot of others in between. And uh, the last one, and um, I've actually spoke to Kurs Mayer uh, yesterday. He said he's going to come make contact with you and he'll, he'll tell the experience. He was my officer at that stage. So he said, Andre, just make sure that you give the right perspective to the story and don't just tell me your version. So it was once again, we had four gunships with us. And uh, at that stage, the mix were or something was at Kahama and and uh, the M loss, the mobile air operations team that was operating with us said, yeah, we, there's jets and we have to find a safer place for the four gunships that was um, working with us at that stage. So once again, off you go, not on the roads, please not on the roads, but quickly go and chop a LZ for these helicopters because when they take off, they've got to stay low and they've got to land very quickly and we're going to work themselves so they get out of arm's way. So off we go on this road, which we've traveled Lots of times we know the road, so we kind of like crisscross the road. So, and I see elephants pull on the road, and I think to myself, freaking if the elephants can walk here, surely the buffalo can drive here, you know, that kind of thing. And um, this is this is after two years in the bush, so you get this sensory perception. You you kind of yes, now oh man, you know, you can kind of like feel that. And um, I was do I, I was going fast, and I was. Taking chances on this on this road, non-road, it's just like a, 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 a animal track. And um, I was leading, and my hair in the back of my neck started. I thought, Fuck. I said, "Quiz, I've I've been doing about five or ten k's now in front. Do you mind taking over? Then you can do the last bit. We're gonna get close to the place where we want the choppers to land, and then we can cup a." A quick landing zone for them and so on. And to this day, I feel sorry. I should have probably just like grinned and bared it, but it would have been me then. And uh, Chris came past, gave me a wave, and got to a little enclosure. Perfect, perfect minefield. And um, it wasn't long. He was, I could see the dust of his vehicle. And then I saw the mushroom. You hear the sound afterwards. And the uh, oh, tickets, the oh, Chris, and he. And, and, and this particular, it was a double, it was it was diagonally across the road. So he hit it on the one side and detonated on the one and on the other side. The vehicle was still upright, but there's photos which we'll, which we'll post for you. It was lying in the front, front because the back one kind of like slows it down. I hit the front one, but there were palm seeds and duitskissies. It's a little wooden box with a plastic explosive in with a dead. 
and uh, bombs heads high above, uh, bombs head detonated, and shrapnel went into his head, into the back of his arm. I remember the one side of his face was black because of the blast and 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 things like that. Uh, everybody okay, but shaken, and um, we got his arm in a sling and gazavacked him, and then dealt with the vehicles, and and that was my last mine, and um, uh, I I clawed out. Um, in, in December of 86, and I think Christmas helped me, but that was a few months before. So the Cracker Jack trophy in, in my unit, um, not necessarily my name, because I was the, the platoon sergeant, but definitely the offer. So Andre Udendahl's name is on there and a few others, and 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 Christmas. It's in the museum, but some of the plaques are missing, so we just have to rectify the plaques and give the guys the honor where it's due so that they can lay claim to their, to their trophy. But then again, I, I, you know, we once built a, 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 a 8K a OP uh, on, on a church roof in, in Angola. And, and one of my guys carrying the sandbags uh, fell through the, the roof and he was hanging on a, on a, on a, on a nail by his arm. And uh, there was a report that went in there. One, one of my Bushmen injured his hand while we were trying to recover a, a vehicle. And the report went through. So the officer commanding of our unit flew out. And I was wearing shorts. And he didn't like the fact that I was wearing shorts. And he, he gave me a name. And I'm sure if he meets me today and I tell him, that's the nickname you gave me, you'll remember. But uh, that was the, the end of my military career. Now that you talk about the museum, I'm very glad you mentioned it because you told me about the clock, uh, the bell, which you people yes. got from the um, Catholic Church somewhere. Can, can you share us that story, please? Uh, so uh, I think Donny van der Berg is, there, is, is, is more um, uh, qualified to, uh, to talk about it. But as I said, there was an interaction between us and the church and there was, um, there was medical aid, there was food given, there was care given. And uh, the nun at that stage thought it was only apt for us to take care of this because somebody's going to come along and take the bell and and take it as 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 bait, uh, war, war you know spoils of war type of thing. But this was a gift from from uh, the nun and um, the bells had always an honorary place at our unit, um, still in the Caprivi. And when the unit was disbanded, the the bell. Um, got its rightful place in in the museum. It's all in storage at the moment, and it's and it's sad that we don't get an an opportune you know place building or institution that that we can that we can show it um, in the humanity that it must be shown. You know that um, we were taking care of of people in in um, Angola that was needed to be taken care of. You know, that kind of thing. And it's not only the bell there. I'm sure there's a lot of other things there as well. But then you've got the funny side of it, the Cracker Jack trophies there uh, next to the bell to show that, uh, that the guys had, um, had positives and negatives happen to them while they were there. The one thing which came out in the second episode of uh, 3 1 Battalion Old Boy Speak, which you couldn't make, sadly, is the food. Everybody there, like testifying, they had the best food in their life while they were to me about. Is this was true? Oh, so, so as I said, you know, when you when you deployed, you deployed like any other unit. You would eat the the box um, number one to number five. Um, initially, it was Western food. It was in a in a brown box with with white plastic. Then, I think it. Uh, when there was lots of black units, may, may, might have given feedback to say that they don't want they want more, you know, traditional lay kind of food. And then the the green the green wrapping came on onto the food, and it was um, maize meal and 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 meat and things, and not so much the the milkshakes and the and the things that the, that the white guys liked. So uh, there was a, a much better balance in the diet there of 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 the on the operational side. And then, of course, we, we traded those illustrious chickens and, and bookies and things like that to, to, to say. Another thing, just before I come back to the, to the food of, of the, the regimental side in, in, the, in the base, the, we used to call it Omega Sands because 
it was a um, it was like a hotel because we had this exquisite catering and and white linen and and tea time was a big occasion and when the visitors came it was a big occasion so we had all the facilities and amenities to to really showcase the um, the nicer side of war if you could if you could say that the regimental life of a of a, of a unit where Bushmen were fighting a war, but nobody knew that side, and they came to visit the base, and it all looked out. But these guys are having a fantastic time. So um, that that was the once again the, the the opposing sides to to the to the eating. So the incident that I want to talk about is um, later in in my in my stint of deployment, we could. Um, get on the radio and ask, say our guys haven't had um, fresh food for two weeks, three weeks. You could ask for a, a rat run to be parachuted into your location. We call it a deck drop. And it's usually done at night. So you would requisition T-bone steaks, Coca-Colas. Uh, they wouldn't give you hard tack, obviously, because you're on a foot patrol deployed in the bush, but you certainly cool drink and, and meat could be done. And a few tins of, of food in between. And um, we, with all due respect to the Air Force, we're magnificent friends there, but sometimes the DAC pilot and, and the crew and the, and the, the loadmaster got the, got the things a bit wrong. And, and also the, the log guys that had to load the pallet. So usually it was on a, on a, on a pallet all strapped together with um, pari parachutes three or two or one, depending. And uh, we would give them a, a, a lat long in the bush and they would say, okay, they'll be there at 10 o'clock at night. Make sure you build three fires in a, in a triangular shape and we will deposit the, the load right there. Um, so firstly, the radio, we could hear the DAC flying in dark moon, but you could hear it, but you can't see it. No lights, of course, and things. And we would call the, the call sign that we were allocated to and they were probably calling a call sign that they were allocated but two totally different frequencies because that's where everything um, falls down in the military operations type of thing and eventually they saw the fires and they thought okay well let's wait you can't see the damn thing coming down you can you can hear some of it when it's close but then it's usually too late so you make sure that you're not close to those three fires and sometimes they miss the target and um yeah, you can't really see what's coming. And then when we opened it, um, usually at night we would just leave everything like that and, and try and try and stay away from any noise that was um, that was uh, in the area. So we try and defend it the best we could. But uh, the next morning, lo and behold, um, we opened up all the uh, the meat packs and it's and it's um, it's pork. Now, what happened with the Bushmen is that we got a lot of um, profits coming over from Zambia and, and the surrounds. And um, according to their religion, they're not allowed to eat pork. So we would, um, the leadership would take whatever pork we could, we could carry and, and we had the appetite for, and the rest we would bury. So that, that's the operational side of, of, uh, of a, a DAC drop where we clearly said, look, our troops don't eat pork, give us steak. And then we got the pork. Anyway, nice pork chops. Uh, but on the on the base side, it was um, magnificent. The best um, catering, um, as I said, um, Sergeant Major Shackleton was an absolute master of his trade. Um, it wasn't mass-produced food. It wasn't like one sai or two sai or eight sai, for instance, where you had a 800 um, troopies eating slosh out of a fark pan. Um, it, was, it was proper dinner and, and dining. Um, we were deployed most of the time. We we got in on the action if we were lucky enough at, at the base. Uh, but most of the time it was for visitors and officers and things like that. But as I said, everybody ate very well at the base. And and tea, um, yeah, it, was, um, it was really a high tea. It was a magnificent, magnificent uh, catering. So in, in that case, we were fortunate. We obviously, over weekends, uh, we got naughty. Uh, frequented the bar and now we're going to go and raid the kitchen and I was caught one day um, we had a, a German engineer at our base busy doing waterworks or something or he was doing sewage or some related uh, civil contractor and uh, Sergeant beside note on my one side and um, we managed to open the 
the uh, the fridge, which was a magnificent big walk-in fridge with racks and racks of food. And I thought, well, this beef hind quarter looks fairly appetizing. And I had this big, I could hardly carry a chunk of of beef on my lap in a Land Cruiser bucky. And we were stopped by Sergeant Major Shackleton and he said, what are you doing? I said, sir, we're just going to return this to the kitchen quickly. So um, caught red handed with a hind leg of beef in a Land Cruiser bucky on a Sunday afternoon with the expect expectancy of going to have a nice roast. I think we would only get that um, ready to eat in a few days' time anyway. But you guys never had like exploding rations. I, I spoke to some free to battalion men. I think it is Major Bottoms Heinz. And he said they got these trains rations which were brand new and being tested and the thing started exploding in their uh, machilas. They thought they were on an attack and then they realized it was chemical combination and the heat and it just exploded all the time. Oh, in the tin cans. Yeah, no, I... I um... The only, um, it was a granate eiers or something like that, um, or eiers or something. The, the guys had different names for different dishes. But as I said, they, those were usually in the mass catering kitchens. And I feel sorry for that, guys, as well. You know, um, waking up at four o'clock in the morning while everybody's also probably in the training bases awake already to, to, to cater for so many hundreds of people and, and to deal with all the complaints. Yeah, that must have been a particular challenge as well. Yeah, I can just imagine to have to feed people, you know, and they, young men, they are burning calories. They eat a lot more than, than most. And then you have to start again and start again. And if it's like a Jippo Guts outbreak, certainly that's going to come back on you. I wish one of the chefs would actually come in. Tell us about the experiences. I'm sure we can arrange that. Yeah, that would be nice. Now, now this museum of yours, where the clock is and where the, the bell and, and your cracker jack, where's that? Can the public actually go in and look at these things? So our, our, most of our troops were um, relocated to Platfontein, which is on the outskirts of Kimberley. So the McGregor Museum in Kimberley at the moment has um, um, most of our memorabilia. Um, but we're in the a, in a process of, of uh, discussing that. And it's, um, it's in the process where we're going to try and find a, a more appropriate military home for, for our artifacts. And that would be done through your association, I, I suppose. Yeah, so the association is busy negotiating with uh, various people in Pretoria and so on and to try and find a, a suitable home and a suitable time to do this. So what happened afterwards? I mean, you must have counted the days. I mean, you, you had something like 40 days, isn't it? And then you know you're going home. Uh, is it with regret that you're leaving your men behind? You know, so, uh, in, in my particular case, I stayed an extra year. So I think it was Project Buttermilk or something like that. So it was court deans. So I was going to finish in 85, but I then stayed an extra year. And, and um, I was um, happy to stay that extra year because it was exactly what you were describing now. At that stage, the, the bond between myself and the troops and so on, they were... Uh, um, um, it grows like family and... and I was young enough and adventurous enough at that stage to to still stay. But then I remember a distinct uh, conversation with my mother over the radio telephone from the signals room in, in Amiga via Walfus Bay, uh, where uh, the radio relay was speaking to her and say, where she said, oh, just get out of the bush and come and make something of your life, please, my son. And I, I think that and a, and a few other um, circumstances regarding leadership uh, made my decision to um, to then go and study, rather. So what did you study? Uh, human resources management. Uh, but as I said, you know, a lot of people don't don't do what they study, but it's a building block in your development as a, as a human. So... Um, I should have done woodwork because I'm into the carpentry and the and the logistical side of, of the art world now. And uh, but yeah, human resources will always be a, a major building block in anybody's um, development as a person. 
Well, we can never say anything wrong about carpenters, can, can we? I mean, Jesus was one. Yes. I love woodworking, by the way. It's one of my hobbies in life. I'm really hoping once we're in Thailand now, I can get a room somewhere and get the old workbank and the uh, tri-bank and all those things going again. I would really love to do it. It's, it's, very, it's very therapeutic working with wood, yes. Yeah, absolutely, because you can smell it and you can actually see it taking shape here and it doesn't argue with you. You know, that's the damn thing with law. You always get the client, but he doesn't want to listen to you. And then what's the use? You know, after a while, you say to him, okay, well, uh, just remember one thing. I'll always be walking out of a court. But you, I'm not so sure as you pay me up front. Yes. You know, you get that type of thing. Is <laughs> it anything? Uh, but after you left Free One Battalion, what, what happened to you when um, you, you attended camps? Yes, so I, I did a, a few camps. I'm I'm uh, disappointed that I didn't go back to um, to Amiga for camps. But then I I kind of like excelled. I played a bit of rugby and and things like that. So and my student life and and rugby and sports and uh, kept me kept me close to home. So I just did a few camps at Tigerberg Commander, uh, based in Belleville in the Cape, and um, until the commander system disbanded and that. That was the end of, of the military career for, for most of us. Yeah, that is one of the great tragedies, actually. It's one of the mistakes which a new government made, in my opinion. I might be wrong, but it's my opinion only. Uh, they should have kept those men. But they had their ideas. Looking back now, 3-1 Battalion 201 is a famous, famous battalion. But I do know that they were also betrayed in the same way as Free Two Battalion. Yeah. They were disbanded. You had your final parade. Perhaps not the fireworks which we had at the Free Two One, where some of the officers walked onto the parade ground to tell what they think of of the politicians. And I know that I believe it was Willem Rotter who collected 33 pieces of silver to give to uh, then President the Clerk. We refused to take it, by the way, and called it disgusting or something like that. Once again, that happened. But looking back at the regiment, looking back at your bushmans, is it with pride or is it with regret or perhaps with both? I think what, what we must realize with with the, the, the walk that the bushmen had to walk, they were um, firstly in Angola working for the Portuguese government, uh, the Fletchers, they were part of the uh, Portuguese secret police arm, arm of the, uh, the government, and they were chasing the enemies of the state as, as trackers and uh, well-trained operatives in, in Angola as the Fletchers. And we must see it in that light. That was the first betrayal um, with the revolution in Angola. Um, when the South African government um, realized that um, they could make use of the of the guys that went to three two and the guys that then came to three one battalion, um, there was a, a chance for them to get to get reestablished and and their home, and they were there for a, a few decades. And then the second betrayal came um, when they went down to to Smitsdrift. And then eventually from Smitsdorf to Plattfontein. So it's a, it's a, it's a, you know, for a for a small um, nation like that to be chased and hunted in in southern Africa for for hundreds and hundreds of years um, because they're small and they live in 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 isolation and they nomads and they they hunt and they usually hunt somebody else's herd. So. You know, the, it's a it's a sad state of affairs for them, and and maybe we should see it in the positive light that they was that they were given temporary homes that uh, certainly extended their uh, their existence, and we hope that in the future that they can find us a similar uh, place in the sun where all of us live. Uh, it's just a question that the numbers are dwindling and the and the actual um, way that they live. Is in small pockets in southern Angola still, in Namibia, in Botswana, 
a year in the Cape. Um, there's a, a sanctuary for, for some of them, but, you know, the language and the culture and everything is, is busy getting all gray and, and, and filtered into, into other existence. If you go back to, to Platfontein now, and it's the same too with our, our friends at Pomfret, um, by no means are there soldiers left. A handful. The rest is all inhabited by by other um, tribes, nations, nationalities, and 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 people of the area that that find the accommodation and uh, and and they live in these areas. And there's there's not much left of 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 our unit, and and not much left of our sister unit. If someone's listening here yeah, and want to get involved to assist the Bushman uh, Battalion. Uh, what do I do? Well, we've got the um, the veterans organization. So we, we try and, and um, as we're doing with this action, is to try and save um, the legacy of, of, of what we've did and what, what they did and, and give them the honor and the respect that, that's due to them for the sacrifice that they, that they made in, in serving Angola, serving um, Southwest Africa serving South Africa and um, and uh, in in writing down the stories or telling the stories is the, is the only way that we're going to have some some figment of, of this left for years to come to understand what happened there and and to share the experiences of, of these wonderful people.